Uh, this talk will focus mostly on what is a Skype system and how it affects Erlang. So let's begin from the beginning. When we talk about type systems, we first have to think about what is a type system. Uh, most of you have already heard talked about used type systems, but um, I also bet that most feel sometimes a bit uh, uncomfortable with uh, explaining what is a type system to someone. I myself feel that way. So because of this, I try to make uh, a simple and clear analogy of what is a type system. And thinking about a lot of things, about the grammatics, about the dictionaries, the best that I could reach is a jigsaw puzzle. Yes, a jigsaw puzzle, but why? Because as you can see on that puzzle piece that is on the screen right now, uh, any function in a programming language has expectations and returns. It's a simple contract. Your function uh, to fetch a user, an user from the database, it expects an username that is a string and it returns an user. So you have those contracts on your software. You have hundreds, thousands of them. And sometimes if you have programmed Erlang, as we are talking on this, uh, on this event, or something else like JavaScript, PHP, or anything else that does not have a type, you might have uh, had some problem like, whoops, a breach of contract. When you try, for example, to sum a number and a string, and things get really weird on different languages, why are you trying to do something that does not, uh, that's not expected? On this example, on the image, I put two different jigsaw puzzle pieces whose fit is incorrect. So as you can see, it would not fit correctly. It would be awkward. It would just not work. The same way that a function that returns a certain thing on a certain format, let's say a string, would not fit well as the input for a function that expects something else for example, an integer. The type system is just a formalization of this, of you having those expectations and uh, those contracts clear and ensuring that things fit where they should. As you can see on this image, uh, the four puzzle pieces fit with each other because they are meant to this. Is this puzzle correct the way I'm building? I don't know. The type system cannot tell you if uh, what you're making makes sense on the real world. If uh, uh, you can treat an user as a paying person and also as a, a company and whatever. That is, the type system cannot guarantee that your logic makes sense. It cannot guarantee that your business uh, domain is correct, but it can guarantee that the way you use your functions is correct by checking if uh, the contracts are really filled. And congratulations. In less than five minutes, you just learned completely what's a type system without having to solve any formula. So, now that we know what is a type system, you would probably say, okay, this is great. I like it. Let me think about it. Um, finding out that my program has a problem before I even run it, before someone calls the support department to complain, this is a dream. And yes, it is. So, at this moment, you are thinking to yourself, great, I love this, but why Erlang and Elixir does not have it? So let's talk about this, how Erlang was unsuccessful at typing. It was unsuccessful at getting a type system. 
but why? To start, um, Joe Armstrong, at some moment, I think that one of his versions of the Programming Erlang book has written that Erlang did not have a, a type system at first because he, I mean, dang, because it was John Hubbard and uh, I never remember his name, sorry, sorry, sorry. But they did not know how to make a type system. And without that knowledge, there was no way they could make one. They were used to, they were used to use dynamic typed languages, which are languages that do not have a type system, just like Erlang, PHP, JavaScript, whatever. So Erlang at its first conception was a dynamic language. And also talking about it, Developer experience when using type systems is not great. That is what uh, someone that uh, has programmed in Java thinks about type system. Because on Java, for example, you have to explicitly say everything. You have to uh, fill your, your code with a lot of weird annotations. And uh, this is a problem that people find with type systems. That's not the truth anymore because nowadays we have something called type inference, which is a system for which a type system can analyze, uh, analyze your code and guess what are the types that you're meant. Let's not get too far on this, but TLDR, type systems were always a bit hard to use. They were not really friendly. Just like programming languages, if you think about Elixir comparing to, I don't know, C, Algol, or something else, you will notice that uh, a long time ago, programming languages were hard. It was hard to do anything. There is, was little help for the developer. And nowadays, we move to every time and more languages, systems, frameworks that are developer centric because in the end, the developer is the one who does the things. Okay, so type systems are great, but they are hard to use and we don't know how to use. Well, that happens. After Erlang was made public in 97, in 97, uh, Philippe Wadler along with Simon Marlow Actually, I think that uh, who started the idea is Philip Wadler only, but the paper also has Simon Marlow. Uh, has talked with Joe Armstrong. What if Erlang was typed? So, Wadler had like one year of a sabbatical and was thinking, what to do now? Let's type Erlang. This seemed fun. And uh, I don't think it was really that fun. So, it did not work in the end. I mean, it worked, but not as much as he wanted. Erlang was typed, but only a subset of it. You could uh, ensure that some basic things on the uh, hand time were properly typed, were safe. But everything that touches processes that involves message passing, no, just no. And because of that, along with the changes that would have to be done with uh, any system that uses the Erlang, that is, with the lack of backwards compatibility, made this be an unsuccessful attempt, which is unfortunate. But we can't always win. Life is hard as usual, as you can see. So let's think about it. I make myself a list of evil things that makes Typing, uh, writing a type system hard. So let's start with the first thing. Hot code load. Everyone that has come to Erlang or Elixir at some point was dissuaded about the idea of hot code swap. Let's change the code while it's still running. The idea is great, I love it, but it's hell. It's like a part of our hell. It's the worst thing ever. 
nothing can work on this thing because you are breaking every expectation of how a software program runs. But there are more. There is more than just this as a problem. We also have the question about process identifiers. As you know, because I mentioned it before, a type system analyzes the type and the contracts of what one type should be and what you expect. A process identifier on the context of Erlang points to a process that might or not exist, that might be on any state, that might be anything, because that's essential for how Erlang can ensure fault tolerance. If you have a programmed Erlang or Elixir for the case or whatever, you have found out that when you send a message, it's an asynchronous operation. You just send and there is no guarantee that the destiny has received it. Why? Because we want to ensure that you don't um, rely on weird expectations. So you have to explicitly expect something because by default, to handle any problem, Erlang just say, let it go, let it break, let's keep on. Continuing, because of this on the process being something that is mm, a bit isolated and you have no idea what it is and it can be anything and it might even not be a thing, it might be dead. You also have a problem with a message person because you are doing the same thing in <laughs> another context. The process might be alive, the process might not be alive, the process is on a state where it's expecting this message. You're sending a message that it might not be. It's almost impossible to guess what's happening. So it's really hard to type Erlang because of those things. As I was talking about pro processes, actors, in this case, the processes, are just uh, isolated functions. They are like anonymous functions. They are named functions that are run on an isolated context. As you might have seen, you saw my previous presentation about uh, supervisor systems. I mean, about uh, supervisor trees. You can search on YouTube for code bean, Charlotte, supervisor trees. I explain how the scheduler for Erlang works. A process, which we may call an actor, is just an isolated data piece that runs a function. And that function might call another function and might call some another function. So you cannot just uh, attribute to a certain process a certain characteristic of being something because it can be anything. Also, have I mentioned it to you that hot swap is a thing? Yes, hot code uh, reload is what makes everything hard. Here we have an illustration of how you do a hot swap in production. Yes, you have to do exactly all those things, including the uh, pentagram on fire. It's not easy. <laughs> anyway, after we have been unsuccessful at typing Erlang, here at Uppsala University, we decided to try something else. Instead of a common type system, a strict type system that just tells you, I can prove your code is correct, we made a dialyzer, which uses the, op the inverse of the usual, uh, of the usual way of uh, treating, a code, uh, treating the code as a type system. Instead of proving your code is correct, that everything fits together, it does the post find there it certainly and completely and 100% is incorrect to point to, hey, you made a bad code, it will never work out. And that way, it means that it works in a backwards compatible way. Because if your code's broken for some reason, if your code's weird, it will treat it as usual day by day. So again, Dialyzer will only point out when it's 100% certain that our code is wrong. Otherwise, 
it will assume that you know what you're doing. It will assume that you are correct. Because you should, right? So I put on the slides uh, the fact that it's an optional gradual type system. An optional type system means you can write your codes, compile, and run without ever touching it. So it means you don't need to use dialyzer at all if you don't want. But if you want, you certainly can start using it as an additional step of your pipeline. For example, to make it impossible for 100% certainly broken codes to go to production. A gradual type system is a type system where you have the option to not touch a certain part, you just say it can be anything. C Sharp has this. I think that's Scala too. So it's basically, I wanted uh, a certain part of my code to be properly checked to ensure that it's on the way I expect. But this one here is my weird JSON library. Let's pretend it does not exist. Assume that it's always right. How long with this? I made it on the slides that dialyzer is better than nothing. And I can say that. I started the programming with PHP. So I would never know if anything was wrong until the last second because uh, we don't even have uh, uh, we don't even have uh, an eager compilation. So we just let it be compiled on one time because it's an interpreted language without type system. So it's better to have something than nothing. So if you use dialyzer on a certain specific way, it will find some, not all, not most. I would not even say that half of your usual books it would find, but it will find some and it will be a positive outcome but you need a lot of discipline for this because otherwise you make your, your life hell. <laughs> uh, I cannot go further on why, but uh, I will try to simplify saying this. If you not type it properly, you will confuse the type system. <laughs> and this is the case for dialyzer. Anyway, let's go back to dialyzer. How it runs? Well, I'll try to, to point out and explain how dialyzer runs over your codes. This explanation can even be extrapolated for other kinds of type systems. It's not really a correct way what I'm going to show, but it uh, works an, as an abstract explanation. So consider that the way I will do the dialyzer uh, passing is not how it is really done in the real world, I mean, how the code runs. But it's approximately, so you have an idea. Let's say you have your place-hating uh, web ab application, and somewhere on the code, you have this line, Hate, hater, hater, English is hard, let's say, see hating for the city plaza, whose hate is for dot two, doesn't matter. It's just an example code. We have here the model for the header because dialyzer is going to check, okay, you call it header.c hating and pass it this map as a parameter. Let's see step by step if things are like they should. So it's analyzing now the header model and it sees a function called c underscore rat rating which accepts parameters. As you can see on the right side of the screen, it's annotating that, let me move this, wait. It's annotating that C hating is a function that expects something called parameters and can return anything because don't know anything about that function. And that params, it's a thing on that function that we also have no idea what it is about. So it can be anything, okay. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, there is a map fetch here. It's using the params variable. So that can only mean that the params variable has to be a map. If it's not a map, then things will certainly break because map.fetch expects a map. 
So let's annotate this. We have the argument of C hating as params, and params has to necessarily be a map for it to be successful. Okay, let's go to the next uh, line. Okay, this map fetch can return a variable called rate. I have no idea about this variable. It can be anything, right? Then the next line is a binding, a binding of a variable called premium, question mark, which uses a map get on params. See, a map get. It's because params is necessarily a map. Mm, and it returns that value or false. Okay, what this means? I have no idea. The map says, uh, the map might have that key called premium with some value or might not. And if it has, what's the value? I have no idea, I don't have any information. So this means that premium can be anything, okay. right? Well, on the next step, we have a KZ clause using that premium question mark variable. And it says, KZ premium is true and KZ premium is false. Oh, so that means that necessarily the uh, premium question mark variable has to be either a true or a false, that is a Boolean. So if that value exists on the map, it has to be a Boolean. If we default it, it has to be a Boolean. That seems to be facts. So let's put here, premium question mark is a Boolean. Next slide, let's interpret the next line. Okay, uh, as you know, on, prog uh, on programming, when doing code analysis, you usually have to first solve the innermost operation, then you go back. It's the same thing on math. So here, before we can know what the function mean, we have to apply this operation right here, which is rate height plus two. Okay, let me think. Plus, that's an Erlang uh, native function whose, um, whose specification necessarily says that a number plus another number is a number. That makes sense. So if it uh, is a number, that's another number, it can only be a number. So necessarily that height variable is a number, right? Otherwise it will break, I think. Okay, so let's see this variable. It's called improved height. What do you know about it? Not much, so it can be anything, right? I don't care about the return. Oops, look at this. The only two poten po possible branches for this call are those two which I highlighted. One calls mean, which is a basic function from Erlang that uh, returns you the smallest number between the two you passed for it, and the other, just returns the variable height. We know that this bind, call it height, is a number. It only means one thing. For this to be uh, correct, we know that improved height is a number. Small detail that's not mentioned in the slides. Technically, this that I just did will not happen on dialyzer. It checks the post, so we too guess it can be anything, etc., etc. So I cannot guarantee. Anyway, going back, the next line says Erlang element, whose first argument is improved height, and the second argument is the model variable, height description. Erlang element is a function from the Erlang standard library, library where you fetch the I don't know how to say this in English, but the N entity of the tuple who is the second argument. On this case, look at the model variable height description. It's a tuple full of strings. So it's fetching any of those strings. Let's say that improved height was the number two. It would fetch the second elements of that uh, tuple which would probably be something like horrible. So by looking at this, we see a few important things. Erlang element expects the first 
argument to necessarily be an integer because for you to fetch a certain element of a, of a tuple, you have to say which element it is and it cannot be, I don't know, two and a half, the two and a half and the element. It has to be the first, second or third. So this means that the proved height necessarily has to be an integer. And this propagates upwards. Do you remember the height? Height is a, uh, was a number. Number is either an integer or a float. But now that we, we have seen that it's being used as an integer, the only, success way, the only successful way for this call to execute is if the height is an integer. So on the right side, you can see uh, that I marked rate and improved the rate both as integer. That means the only way for this not to cause an error is if hate is an integer. Charlotte, sorry there is to interrupt. Detail. We have just two more minutes. We know minutes that Erlang element session. returns an element from a tuple. And that tuple called hate description is just a tuple of strings. And uh, the other branch calls no hate, which is another model variable, which is a string. So this means that on the only two possible branches for this function, a string is returned, right? So the type system now knows that when you call C hating, you pass a map and it will return a string, which is a binary, by, by the way. With this, what we can do? We can go back and check how we are calling this function. We see here on the top uh, most terminal that we are calling header.chating and passing a map. Okay, chating expects a map, so, so far so good. The first key of the map is called name and it's a string. Well, we don't know a lot about this, so I guess it's correct, right? The second is hate and it's a float. Wait a moment. C hating wasn't that function that receives a map, a map that might have a key called hate, and that key shouldn't it be an integer? Yes, that's exactly what it is. Also, disclaimer: dialyzer might not be able to catch uh, such subtle details, but let's pretend it does. It found out that with 100% of, uh, of chance, you have done something wrong. So you hand dialyzer. Oops, I missed the slide. Uh, as you can see, I am highlighting that the hate parameter is incorrect. So you hand dialyzer, and after, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, it depends if it's the first time you are running it, depends on your code base. I'll give you a quick tip. It builds like a cache of the functions and what it uh, uses. So the first time is very slow, but then it goes fast. Anyway, going back, it analyzes your code and say, analysis failed with error. Thanks, dialyzer, I guess. I have no idea what you mean, but something is wrong. It's saying that thing, okay, it means that something is wrong and we have to fix. And that's your crash course of dialyzer. Uh, basically, it will analyze your code. It will try to prove that you are wrong. And when you are wrong, it will point where it's wrong. I'll bet you will not understand the error message at all. Anyway, we are almost at the end of the presentation now because we understand what state Erlang is right now. Erlang is using this. You have this option. It's better than nothing because it can point you that your code's wrong. But good luck, you will need it. Anyway, the second part of the presentation, I mean, of the subtitle is session types. We don't have a lot of time, so we, I'll keep it short. Mm, let's talk about it. Uh, session types is a theory 
on mathematics and computation and those things, sorry, not really a lot into the academic words, but it's something that uh, talks about those types. Do you remember the types, the fittings of the jigsaw? It was about um, data, if it's a string or it's not a string, right? Well, as we pointed before on the Erlang and successful type of 97, that uh, it's not great for things that change, like communication protocol, which is the case of an actor, of uh, a network, of uh, a third party site, I don't know. So session types try to pick this thing, this behavior, and make it into a thing that you can uh, analyze, make it into a type. So you are basically describing a type which is the flow that, uh, that uh, this thing, this thing, in this case, the actor, the protocol or whatever, does. I have a very, very simple example here, a one-liner. It's the most simple example possible, but it's still an example. Here you have the type, college shop which describes the behavior of an online e-commerce. I skipped on slide again. Uh, it has Carlos, two sorry possible to branches, that is, two uh, paths that you can take. Either add, which would add a book to your cart, or check out, which would pay for the purchase. On the case of add, here it's saying, the shop should receive the book, the type book, so you should send it a book, and it will go back to the uh, shop type, which is go back to the initial state. If you do checkout, you have to pass your card information, your address information, and then the, pro uh, the protocol closes. And that's it. So with one line, you describe it almost every e-commerce ever. And think about this, if you ever use the type system. You are usually talking about receive a string and go back a string, but you cannot describe a, a line of time, a timeline. Here, if you added another, another point, another path, you would have a rather complex timeline which the type system would try to prove that you are following properly. We see it means it would guarantee you that it would work or that it should at least. 